Thank you, Seth. Thank you all for coming here. Thanks to the Schrader family for, uh, for sponsoring uh, this event. And that comment about all my en enemies uh, reminds me of a, 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 a man I co-authored a number of books with, Jim Bennett, a colleague of mine at George Mason years ago. He's from Mississippi, grew up in Mississippi. And on things like this, he said, uh, he would say, if they're nipping you in the butt, you know you must be ahead of them. That was sort of a, <laughs> that was a, that was an old Southern slang. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I never forgot that. And he also said, government is like a septic tank. The big chunks rise to the top. <laughs> so you know, I, I see some people writing that down, taking notes. That's what I learned at the Mises Institute. Uh, 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 before I left the hotel this morning, I, I read an article about uh, Tucker Carlson's latest uh, uh, antics. He's, in, he's still apparently still in Moscow, and he and his staff went to a grocery store, and they filled up a grocery cart with what they thought was a week's worth of groceries, and they didn't look at any of the prices. And, uh, and they, they asked each other, well, how much do you think this would cost back home? And they all settled on about 400 bucks worth of groceries. And then when the bill came, it was 104. And, uh, and, and Tucker Carlson said, well, that, that really uh, that radicalized him. He said against the, the establishment in America and what, they, what they're doing. And so I blogged that on something about it on lourockwell.com and, uh, and, and it said, should we send Tucker Carlson an end the Fed t-shirt at least? <laughs> it's, not, it's not the establishment, it's the Fed that's uh, the problem. Now my, my topic, the topic that I gave for this is who benefits from inflation. And some of it sounds pretty pedestrian. Now, you, a lot of you are familiar with reading about the Fed and, and so forth know a little bit about that. But you could write a whole book about that, and I might do that. I might write a book on who benefits from inflation, because the average person, they know they don't benefit from, from inflation. Uh, but, but, but who does? You know, it's, somebody does. And they don't understand that much at all. So, so maybe that, that'd be a whole book that, to talk about. And, so, and, and you could write a whole book, maybe many books. And so in the time I have, I'm just going to mention a few things about who benefits from inflation. And some of the other speakers are probably mention this too, it gets involved in some economic theorizing uh, uh, regarding some guy named Richard Cantillon, a French economist. I'm not gonna get into that. I'm gonna go down a list of uh, things that I think are kind of unique about inflation. And my title could be, Who Benefits from the Fed? You know, it's one and the same after all. And we look at inflation as an increase in the money supply. Well, debtors, of course, benefit from inflation and the federal government is the biggest debtor. So there, that's item number one. And item number two that I, I wrote down here is something that maybe you're not all familiar with, is, uh, is Fed orchestrated bailouts. And when, when, you have Fed, when the Fed, Fed has always financed bailouts of one part of the economy or another, and this is ruinous of capitalism, isn't it? Um, you, you might be familiar with the famous bailouts of after the 2008 crash in uh, and what that did was to tell tell these bankers, Goldman Sachs and Citibank and the rest, profits are yours, the losses are theirs. You know, the taxpayers will cover your losses, profits are yours. That's ruinous of capitalism. That ruins the profit and loss system. You can't have a, a capitalistic profit system if you have this system of fascism, basically. And years ago, I actually wrote several articles called, with titles like Economic Fascism, and one of the things that was a characteristic of that in Germany and Italy in the early 20th century was massive bailouts. And when, uh, you know, fascism was, they allowed private property, but it was very heavily controlled and, and the de facto a part of the state. And so they had to bail them out. And so that's what the Fed has been involved with. For example, in the 90s, there was a whole spate of these. There was one, one thing that they called the, the tequila crisis. Now, for those of you who are tequila drinkers, it wasn't that there was a shortage of tequila any, anywhere. It was that the Mexican peso was devalued, and the, the American big banks, uh, Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs, had been uh, borrowing, buying uh, Mexican bonds big time, and they were stuck. The Mexican government was threatening not to pay. And so uh, Alan Greenspan uh, works hand-in-hand -hand with the White House to orchestrate uh, the bailout so-called Mexican bailout, but it was really a bailout of Goldman Sachs, you know, once again, 
and, and, and the big banks that had uh, borrowed all this money, had held or holding all these Mexican bonds. And then there were these, these genius academic economists who, who uh, started working for a firm called Long-Term Capital Management. And that went bust, and that re they ended up getting a thirteen billion dollar bailout, and that was uh, that was Greenspan's uh, work also, along with the White House, Citibank, forty billion, forty five billion dollars in loans from the government, and a guarantee that if they had three hundred billion and more in losses, that the government would cover that, and in return for that, the government demanded equity in uh, in Citibank. Yeah, how's that for socialism there? Then, of course, the Great Recession in, in 08, uh, the maestro, as Greenspan was called, the Fed printed twice as much money in 13 weeks as it had since in the previous century uh, to, to finance the bailouts of various parts of the economy. And David Stockman's great book, The Great Deformation, uh, gives chapter and verse of what was going on here and that the big lie was that the economy would collapse unless companies like Goldman Sachs, once again, uh, the financier of uh, the political class in Washington, uh, was bailed out. You know, the, the big insurance company, AIG, had to be bailed out. And, and uh, David Stockman points out that after the big bailout of Goldman Sachs, six months later, uh, they were, it was always solvent. There was never any threat of them going under like Lehman Brothers they paid themselves $16 billion in salary and bonuses. And just six months earlier, the entire economy was going to go into the Great Depression again if this didn't happen. I remember Bush saying that. So, so Greenspan and the White House conspired in all of, these, all of these bailout examples, which tells you how ludicrous the idea is that we have an independent Fed. The, 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 since its very beginning, they have claimed that the Fed is ind independent of politics. If you ever saw the movie, The, um, the Big Short, uh, about the, the 08 crash, one of the very last scenes was not a movie scene. It was an actual NBC News scene of uh, uh, the Fed chairman walking out of the White House. I don't know if you remember that from the scene. And that was you know, the, the, the chairman of the independent Fed walking with the White House. And so, so that's, that's how, it, how it works. And so the uh, bureaucrats from the Fed and political hacks from the White House in every administration meet weekly. Yeah, the weekly meetings. Uh, so there's no independence. Uh, it never, never has been. And so, and in return, in return for all this, of course, the Wall Street banks lavishly financed the careers of the uh, the the politicians. And the, the note I wrote to myself here is organized crime on steroids. And, and another, th another thing that's created is uh, my old professor, uh, James Buchanan, who won, won the Nobel Prize in 1986, I think, I guess it was now, it's ancient history now. But he, he wrote a book, co-authored a book called Democracy and Deficit, and they had a big section on what's called fiscal illusion. And it's not the kind of thing that students would read about that much in a textbook. But fiscal illusion is a simple idea that, you know, printing money to pay for government programs uh, makes the perception of the cost of government lower. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it's expensive. Just think if, if the government said, OK, we want to we finance the war in Ukraine and we're going to have to send every family, uh, a taxpaying family, a bill for $20,000 this year. You know, I would imagine that the enthusiasm, there'd be, you'd see far fewer yellow ribbons on trees in America than, you know, the, the color of the Ukrainian flag and, and bumper stickers and all that if you got that $20,000 tax bill to send to the, the criminals in, in Ukraine, as far as that goes. So even Adam Smith, in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776, pointed out, he said that wars would be less frequent and shorter if they were financed by taxes. And he was really expressing this idea that Buchanan called fiscal illusion, uh, that uh, they, and they make the perceived cost of war lower, and everything else, and everything else, not just war. The Fed, you know, when it was created in 1913, it financed about a fourth of uh, World War I. And so that w there might not have been American participation in World War I 
uh, had it not been the Fed in existence. And of course, the income tax came in also at the same time. And the top rate went from, uh, well, it was originally 7%, and it went to 77% to, because there was an emergency, after all, you know, the war, as far as they never did go back down to 7%. Okay. And so, so that's, you know, one example of who benefits from inflation. And, of course, harming the economy with inflation, causing boom and bust cycles and, and just price inflation, uh, creates econ economic instability, depressions, recessions. And that's all good news for the welfare bureaucracy, isn't it? Because it increases the demand for welfare bureaucrats. And so life is always better in Washington, D.C. When the, when the American economy crumbles. And I lived it when I worked at George Mason. I lived in the, the swamp for, for, for eight years. And so I was able to observe that, you know, good or bad, it just keeps on growing no matter what, no matter what happens, but especially when it's bad, as far as that goes. Political business cycles. There's such a thing, there's a literature in economics called political business cycles, and we're about to enter one now. It says, you know, if you take a course in macroeconomics at a university, they'll, they'll, they'll teach you how to stabilize the economy. They'll, they'll say, make statements about how the purpose of the Fed is to stabilize the economy. Here's, what, here's a famous one that uh, many generations of American college students were, were taught about what the Fed does. Okay, this is from Paul Samuelson's famous textbook. He said, the Federal Reserve's goals are steady growth in national output and low unemployment. Its sworn enemy is inflation. <laughs> Paul Samuelson. If aggregate demand is excessive so that prices are being bid up, the Federal Reserve Board may want to slow the money supply. When has that ever happened? Thereby slowing aggregate demand and output growth. If unemployment is high and business is languishing, the Fed may consider increasing the money supply, thereby raising aggregate demand and augmenting output growth. In a nutshell, this is the function of central banking, is to, to, to make everything stable and, and prosperous. And that's what generations of college students were, were taught about the Fed, but the political business cycle, uh, and then there's a big literature on that, uh, it introduces some common sense. And this book by my old professor, two my old professors, James Buchanan and Richard Wagner, Democracy and Deficit, where they talked about fiscal illusion, also talks about the political business cycle. We're in the election, presidential election year now, and so if, if the current Fed chair, chairman wants to keep his job, he has to increase the money, start increasing the money supply and do things that, uh, that the incumbent party wants, that wants to do if he wants to keep his job. And this has happened in history over and over again. There was an economist named uh, Robert Weintraub who wrote, uh, published some academic journal articles about this. About you know, It goes from the 1950s through the 1970s. This is an older article. And every time a new president comes in, it lets it known if he wants faster money growth or if there's already price inflation, he wants slower money growth, the Fed chairman does it for him because he wants to keep his job just like every one of you does who's, who's working. You want to keep your jobs, right? You don't want to get fired. And so, so does the Fed chairman. And so it's, there's built-in instability. Now, in return for taking the heat on, uh, on when the economy does go bad, uh, the, the Fed is allowed to, to accumulate a big slush fund. And part of what happens here is the politicians, of course, they always take credit for the booms. When the Fed creates a boom, the politicians take credit for it. But then when the bus comes, they call in the chairman of the Fed, don't they? And they have like, like this Soviet Union style uh, um, beat down. He sits there and they ask him all these questions. And then when this happened, when Alan Greenspan was before some Senate committee after the crash of 08, it, it was like that. You know, before that, they were calling him the, ma the maestro. There's even a book called The Maestro by Bob Woodward. You know, he's the maestro. He's orchestrating the economy. That's how, that's how they think the economy works. And, and my, fr my friend, the late Yuri Maltsev, told me that uh, when this was happening, Greenspan is on CNN, and they're, they're grilling him, and they're blaming him for, the, for what, what's gone wrong, finally. They got, they got something right, you know, finally. And he said he got a call from an old friend in Moscow. You know, you, those of you who know about Yuri, he was a Soviet defector. He was an advisor of Mikhail Gorbachev, and he became... Uh, uh, a participant in Mises University events for 30 years after he came to, to America. And, uh, and he spoke at many of these events himself. 
And but Yuri told me his old friend from Moscow said, Yuri, well, they take him out back and shoot him about Greenspan because, because, <laughs> because that, that's what they did in the old days in the Soviet Union for somebody <laughs> like that. And, the, and that was his thinking. And uh, they, uh, Yuri assured him, no, he's like, they won't shoot him. They'll, they'll probably uh, you know, uh, give him an even better job okay, somewhere. So, so, so the, the way the Fed finances its, its salaries and its perks and, and everything like, like that is by, by buying bonds. The Fed print, you know, uh, creates money out of thin air and buys bonds. Its income for its own salaries is from the interest on the bonds. Okay, and then the Congress tells the Fed, uh, you, you pay your expenses for running the Fed, and then whatever's left, you have to give back to the Treasury. Now think of the incentive that creates. Okay, if I want to have ten assistants, I'm the, you know I'm some Fed bureaucrat, uh, and I pay them each six-figure salaries, well that increases the expenses, and who cares? You know whatever's left, yeah, we'll send. If there's one dollar left, we'll send it to the U.S. Treasury. And so it gives an incentive to spend pretty lavishly on yourself if that's sort of the incentive created by this. And it also has a built-in incentive for price inflation, doesn't it? Because buying bonds, you're putting money into circulation. You're increasing the money supply when you buy bonds, you know, open market operations. And so out of the self-interest of the Fed bureaucrats themselves and the whole Fed bureaucracy is inflation. It's not, it's not stabilization policy like Paul Samuelson said in, in his flaky textbook, uh, that was the same, the same textbook, by the way, that predicted that in, by, uh, in 1989, the 1989 edition, that by the year 2000, the Soviet economy would be bigger than the U.S. economy. <laughs> it was the same, the same textbook. Okay. And so, and so the, you, know, you know, Ron Paul was, uh, spent many years arguing for auditing the Fed. And there's been very little of that ever, because every, every time somebody proposes that the banking industry circles the wagons and, and usually succeeds. But there have been some episodes where some facts have kind of snuck out. And there was a Wall Street Journal article that I've, I've held on to all these years since 1996 and, uh, about some of this. And I don't know how they got this, this information about some of the perks at the Fed. And I'll just read some of the things. And this was 1996. They had 25,000 employees, very well-paid jo government jobs. There's an air force of dozens of Learjets, fleets of vehicles, a full-time curator of artwork, hundreds of billions of dollars in assets. And in 1996, the head janitor made $163,800 plus benefits in salary. That was 28, year 28 years ago, the head janitor that kind of money and so and so that's how it works when they when they when they buy the bonds they create inflation and it's let the good times roll at the fed so if you want to know who benefits from inflation well there you have it and there's you know first and foremost there's a lot of talk about the you know the big banks and the whole banking industry and all that but the fed bureaucracy itself is the main the main beneficiary and so uh, there are two economists they're both old friends of mine, and uh, Bill Shugart and the late Bob Tolleson, who was a professor of mine at uh, Virginia Tech back uh, when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth, he published an article in the American Economic Review, and he explained the consequence of this in the convoluted language of economies that, that, that is in the economics journals. And here's a quote. This was an, an econometric test of their theory about, about this, the Fed uh, spending money on itself, it said we found a positive and significant ceteris paribus relationship between changes in the monetary base and the size of the Fed bureaucracy. Okay, so so anyway, so I'm just I'm not just telling stories here. There have been articles published in the American Economic Review, which is the top academic peer-reviewed journal in the field of economics, uh, documenting this that when the Fed buys bonds and inflates the money supply, surprise, surprise. The Fed bureaucracy gets bigger, ceteris paribus. You know, all other things equal, there's cause and effect there, in other words. Okay. The Fed also has what I call the Fed's Praetorian Guard. Uh, uh, another old acquaintance, Larry White, he, he's, he's an Austrian school economist. He wrote an article, published an article back in 05 about uh, the Fed, uh, the employees of the Fed. At that time, it had 495 staff economists and 120 consultants. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, and these are all publicists for the Fed, basically. These people, that's their main job. Just like congressional staffers are basically publicists for the member of Congress that they work for. These guys are, and gals are publicists for the Fed. 300 other economists are, are invited to its conferences year in and year out. Uh, Murray Rothbard once said that your, tip, your average academic monetary economist would, would stab his mother to death with a fork for an invitation to a Fed conference. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can make your career. I, you know, I'm among the, the anointed. Uh, that, of all the things Murray ever said in my presence, that, that sticks, that's one thing that sticks out. <laughs> he, was, he was such a brilliant guy, but you can, how could you forget something like that? You know, as a, okay. And uh, anyway, Larry White found that 74% 74 of all academic journal articles on monetary policy were written by Fed economists or economists subsidized in some way by the Fed. Uh, consultants, uh, interns, something like that. So the whole literature on monetary policy is totally dominated by the Fed out there. And so, and so these people are all paid, too. So that's, that's so the, I call it the Fed's Praetorian Guard. Uh, and they, 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 they very quickly try to shoot down any, any criticisms. I was talking to Phil this morning about how one of my students, uh, uh, well, I've had a student come into my office once when I, when I was a professor. He said, you know, I've taken all the courses on monetary economics at the university, and until I took your class, I had no idea there were criticisms of the Fed. No, no, no one ever mentioned it anywhere, and that's, 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 that's how it is. That's how things are. Uh, the Fed is also, uh, um, the, what I wrote in my notes here, the Fed, Fed funding of woke communism. Uh, the, the Fed is now into all sorts of things, not just monetary policy, but more and more uh, Fed research publications are about climate change, racism, inequity, gender discrimination. And they're getting all involved in that now. And, and Janet Yellen is full bore ahead with that. And uh, that's that's the new the new uh, direction of the Fed, not just you know monetary policy. Who you know, who cares about that anymore? Uh, an another a paper written by uh, published by the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, uh, look took a look at uh, the ratio of sort of the Democrat Republican ratio of Fed employees, and they noted first that in in the economics departments, academic economics departments in the U.S. For every one Republican, there's four or five Democrats. So the, the academic economists, it's about four to one, or maybe five to one uh, there. Fed leadership, they have a category called Fed leadership, it's 25 to one. Uh, the younger employees of the Fed, 40 years old or younger, 20 to one. And the Board of Governors, 45 to one. <laughs> I don't know how they got that number, 45 to one, but that, that's, that's what they wrote in this, in this article. And so, so the Fed is just another, you know, woke Washington, D.C. bureaucracy. Uh, and, of course, yes, it does uh, 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 monetary policy and all that, but it's, it's branching out into a lot of other areas. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I mentioned that Joe Salerno a while back, this, this, I think it's a fruitful area of research for the Austrians to get into all these other things the Fed is involved in. You know, we've, we've had a lot of books and, and everything on monetary policy. But but after the crash of 08, uh, there was sort of a it, it was sort of hilarious to me. There were some very prominent people that were try, trying to blame the crash of 08 on first Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> this was in the in the Wall Street Journal, and Ron Paul, of course. It was, it was Ron Paul's. I'll see if I can find the quote uh, that I'm talking about here. Yeah, the Financial Times, there was a, a stockbroker named Henry Kaufman. Who's, he must be 150 years old by now. I, I, I debated him at the Cato Institute in 1983 on, on, on one of my books, uh, and he's still around. And he said, um, this is in the Financial Times, he said, well, Alan Greenspan was a protege of Ayn Rand in the early 1960s. Therefore, the Fed is a libertarian institution Therefore, it's, it's this anti-Fed mentality that caused the crash. That was in the Financial Times. Okay, then in the Wall Street Journal, John Steele Gordon, who's a, a business historian, but in the Wall Street Journal, 
wrote that it was the the, uh, the the blighted breath of Thomas Jefferson, but as as enunciated by Ron Paul, because Jefferson opposed the creation of the first the Bank of the United States, the first the precursor of the Fed. There's a famous debate between Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson took the anti-central banking, uh, and so here's the Wall Street Journal uh, have, with John Steele Gordon saying. Well, this was Thomas Jefferson and Ron Paul, birds of a feather. That's why we had the crash of 08. And after that happened, so the, these people are calling the Fed a libertarian organization. There, there are even a few, few of the so-called Beltway libertarians that were saying this uh, uh, as well. It's, it's shockingly to me anyway. So I looked up, uh, the Fed has a publication called The Structure and Functions of the Fed. And so I, and it's online. Every year there's a new one. And I looked it up. And, I, and they, they, they explain what the Fed does in addition to monetary policy. And I'm just going to rattle off a few things that's on their list of what they do, what they're involved in. And it's hard to believe that the Soviet Union had more central planning than this. It was more pervasive than this. Their list of the, here's, here's, here's our, what we do, what we regulate and control. Bank holding companies, state chartered banks, foreign branches of member banks, edge and agreement corporations, U.S. state licensed branches, offices of foreign banks, national banks, savings banks, non-bank subsidiaries of bank holding companies, thrift holding companies, financial reporting procedures, accounting policies of banks, business continuity, consumer protection laws, securities dealings of banks, information technology used by banks, foreign investment by banks, foreign lending by banks, branch banking, bank mergers. And they, I could go on for like three more pages of reading these things. And, this, and these are all functions that are not monetary policy, additional things that the, the Fed is involved in. And so, uh, so I wrote this article called the, the Myth of the Libertarian Fed, and it was on Lou Rockwell years ago uh, about this. And so this is another big bureaucracy that benefits from inflation. You know, all the, all the people that work in all these, these, uh, these areas of the Fed, it's, it's a, a giant octopus. Uh, of, of government bureaucrats. And so that's also who benefits from the Fed. And so uh, in addition to other things, and I'm sure Joe and Patrick are going to mention other things like the Cantillon effect and all that, but I thought this would be something a little different uh, to know how the, 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 the sort of the, 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 just the blatant self-interest of the Fed bureaucracy uh, really drives a lot of what goes on here. And it seems maybe funny you shouldn't have to explain that to people, but I don't think the average person really knows much about this or thinks about it. And, and so that's about my story for now, and I'm sticking to it. And uh, thank, thank you all for coming and for supporting the Mises Institute. And, uh, and, right, and there, is, there is a $1,000 exit fee. Did we tell you about that? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I meant to send out an email before I came here. <laughs> <laughs>